hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is David Saunders uh, and I'm a curator here at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, California. Um, I'm speaking to you today from my office here at the Getty Villa, uh, which is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. And I'd like to begin uh, by expressing both my honor and respect for the deep history and future of this region. Today's program is part of the Getty's Art Break series in which we hope to offer some fresh approaches to thinking about objects in our collection. And today we're going to be focusing on ancient Greek painted pottery and I'm thrilled to be joined by my friend and colleague Sanchita Balachandran. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sanchita Balachandran. Uh, as a settler on this land, my own land acknowledgement is a work in progress as I try to learn uh, the histories of dispossession and ongoing violence experienced by indigenous peoples in this place. And as I think about how we work towards a return of land to indigenous peoples. Um, so I want to acknowledge the long histories, ongoing presence and futures of indigenous peoples in the place now called Baltimore where I live, which is the homeland of the Susquehannock people and a place of gathering stewardship um, and stewardship for the Piscataway, the Akahanek, the Nanticoke, the Lumbee and the Cherokee peoples. And I also acknowledge my virtual presence on Gabrielino Tongva land. So we are um, delighted to get started. This conversation is really a kind of, well, what we hope is a sort of slightly more polished version of emails and chats and coffee breaks that Sanchita and I have had over the last, I think it's now eight years or so, uh, thinking and talking uh, and speculating about Athenian vase painting. Um, and what we'd like to focus on today at least is, is what we can know about the individuals who made these vessels. And in order to think about this question, um, we're going to study a single object, the one that you can see uh, on the screen from uh, the Getty's collection. It's a fifth century BC terracotta drinking cup. Um, and we're going to use the sort of different phases of production. So potting, painting and firing as a way of, of structuring this, this conversation. Um, but I think really our goal is to prompt as many questions as possible. In many ways, what we're trying to do is not only explore what we can see, uh, but how to approach um, what's hidden or, or unrecorded. Before we get underway though, maybe it's interesting for our, our, our viewers, Sanchita, to, maybe you can tell us a little more as to how you, you got into approaching and studying uh, Athenian pottery. Yeah, so I'm a conservator of archaeological objects and I'm responsible for the preservation, care and research of ancient items um, at the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum. And here you see our Greek ceramics on display in our space. And I have the privilege really of studying ancient people's things for evidence of all the people from the ancient past who might have interacted with them and really most especially their makers. And we have some wonderful examples of Athenian ceramics here. And I've always been curious about exactly how they were made um, for quite some time. So in 2015, I actually co-taught an undergraduate course here at Johns Hopkins University with potter Matthew Heilick. And we tried to make replicas of ancient cups like the one we'll be talking about today. And David, you and I met around the time that I was planning out that course. But I think what sustains my interest is trying to find out who these makers really were, especially since we believe that they were a diverse set of practitioners that included um, poor Athenian citizens, migrant and immigrant workers, uh, formerly enslaved and enslaved peoples, women entrepreneurs and children. And really people of these statuses rarely have the opportunity to leave much archeological or written evidence of what their lives were like. So these pots are one of the few ways that we can kind of be with these ancient people and follow their stories. Right, and I think working with this particular cup, we can um, begin to kind of think about some of those questions and, and, and narratives. Um, as I said, this is a cup uh, here at the Getty and we've chosen it today uh, because it is signed by both the potter and the painter, and you can see the transcriptions and translations up on the screen. Uh, and we'll dig into these in more detail uh, in the minutes ahead. Um, it was made between around uh, 490 and 470 or so BC. It's a sort of stylistic dating, um, presumably as a vessel for drinking wine. What you're seeing here is the inside. This is the interior, what we call the tondo. Uh, and it shows uh, on the left a bearded man uh, standing before a seated youth who holds his head in his hand and is sort of heavily uh, swathed in his drapery. 
Uh, and this might be um, the Greek hero Odysseus on the left, um, trying to persuade Achilles back out onto the battlefield uh, and, uh, during, during the Trojan War. Uh, it's decorated in what we call the red figure technique, um, whereby the background areas are painted with what is a refined clay slip. Um, and this turns a glossy black in the firing process. And this is another thing we'll talk about. Um, while the figures themselves and the ornamental patterns are left the color, the sort of orangey red color of the clay. And then sort of details such as the drapery, the meander patterns, the details of musculature uh, are then added um, with, uh, with a brush, which we will also talk about. Um, maybe it's stating the obvious, but this cup is substantially incomplete. You have to reconstruct this round shape of the vessel uh, from, what is, from what is missing. Um, but it's worth stressing that this is a really big cup. Uh, what survives today is 36 centimeters at its greatest extent. So conceivably we're thinking of something that may be 45 up to maybe even 50 centimeters from sort of handle to handle. Yeah, and some of these cups are very large. Uh, in fact, in these images, you can see people holding a quite large one, though it's actually a little bit smaller than the one we're discussing. Um, and this is from our 2015 class. And I think what's really surprising is that something this huge is actually incredibly light, which helps if you're going to be filling it with wine and drinking from it. Um, the replica pots we produced in our class were made from clay mined near Pittsburgh. And I'll just um, show you one that we made here. And they really don't come close to the lightness of the ancient Athenian ones. So I would say the scale and the lightweight um, reminds us that a pot's qualities are so tied to the clay that they're made from. And certainly contemporary potters are very particular about the clay they like to work with. And at the Getty, material scientists, as well as colleagues of ours in uh, Greece, have done a lot of research trying to understand where these ancient clays come from, um, probably from around Athens. And they were likely selected and further processed to get just the right working and material properties. And cups like these would have been thrown and trimmed to shape on a potter's wheel. And there's a really wonderful and free Getty publication by potter Toby Schreiber, where she looked at Athenian ceramics actually in the Getty collection and described how some of these ancient vessel types were potted. Right, and I think both of us have kind of kept returning to Toby's book. It's, it's a really, it's so valuable to have her kind of practical uh, experience. We have you know, no written records, say by ancient potters on how they may have made a, a cup or a, a storage jar. Um, there are a number of um, uh, images uh, that show potters and painters at work, um, but they are, you know, for one thing, silent and can't be taken as some, what we would call photographic evidence. Um, excavations in the so-called Keramikos, the potter's quarter in Athens, uh, and at other sites around the Greek world um, have brought to light kilns, um, deposits of waste material and some of the traces and spaces uh, in which this work would have been done. Um, but the challenge that we face is reconstructing the kind of the day-to-day -day experience of potters and painters, their rivalries or their training, let alone um, their lives outside of their work as potters and painters. Right, and I think we have to really think about this potter's community as a community, right? They work together, they knew each other, and they're also very visible um, working on their um, their wheels and their kilns alongside these main roads in and out of the city. So we also have to wonder then about how visible their other identities, right? Their social status as poor citizens, migrants, um, women and enslaved people might have been. And in fact, the pot we're examining gets at whether we can really identify who was actually making some of these pots in ancient Athens. Right, so let's look with that in mind a little bit more closely at the cup at the Getty. And what you're seeing here is, is the cup in profile seen from the side. Uh, these are older black and white pictures, but they actually show the uh, signature uh, very clearly. Uh, you see there are three words written around the, I suppose the rim of the foot, uh, which we've transcribed and translated. Uh, Cleophrides Epoiosen Amasidos. Cleophrides, son of Amasis, made it. 
Yeah, and this inscription is not marked into the clay, but it's painted on it. And here, Cleophrates, presumably, um, paints this information on the edges of the foot. So you'd have to be holding the pot a certain way, right, to read it, um, assuming you could even read it. And it means that someone could write this name and chose to do it in a kind of thin clay we call slip, and, and more on that in a minute. So everything about this is very intentional, which really raises the question of why someone wrote this and for whom it was written. Exactly, and it's um, helpful to kind of dig deeper into the actual you know, text that is, that is written. The verb uh, epoiosen, the, the middle one uh, in, in this trio on the right, um, typically is understood to mean to make and, or to do, suggesting that you know, one day in the early fifth century, our man Cleophrides um, sat down before his potter's wheel and through the bowl-shaped form of this cup, uh, and then worked on making a foot. Uh, he would have joined them together using slip, and then he would have fashioned uh, a couple of handles, uh, which he would have then attached to the sides uh, of the cup. And in fact, we do have some images of people actually making pots, some from Athens, but more from an earlier time period in nearby Corinth, where we see actually two people um, working together on a wheel with one person actually shaping the clay while the other person turns the wheel. And we have other ancient depictions of, um, shall we say, workshops, uh, though it's hard to know what exactly these are depicting, uh, showing multiple people at work together. So it does make us ask about the signature and whether it's a bit of a misnomer, because while potting could have been done by one person, um, ceramics making was also certainly a very collaborative activity. Right. And I think the one thing we've sort of keep coming back to is this community of production. And um, to kind of spin that another way, the other fascinating thing about this inscription, as, as you can see, is that Cleophrides um, gives his father's name, son of Amasis. Um, and Amasis is the name of another potter that we know of who was working in Athens um, a few decades earlier. And in fact, uh, on another cup here at the Getty, uh, we have an example of Amasis's signature. So this is um, a cup made around the middle of the sixth century BC and under the handle uh, you see Amasis's name. So it seems highly plausible that um, skills and expertise were passed down in this case from Amasis to Cleophrides, from, from father to son. Um, but unlike Cleophrides, Amasis isn't a typically Greek sounding name. Rather, it seems to be a, a Greek version of an Egyptian name, uh, the name Aphmos, all of which has begged the question and prompted lots of scholarship, um, was Cleophrides' father, Amasis, Egyptian? It's certainly the case that a foreign sounding name shouldn't be taken in isolation as evidence for ethnicity. Um, but looking across at other signatures that we have from potters and painters in Athens at around this time, um, an Amasis who was Egyptian or who in some way had associations with Egypt wouldn't have been out of place alongside other figures such as, you know, there's Lydos, which means the Lydian, um, Scythes, the Scythian, Siriscos, the little Syrian. I mean, yeah, this inscription is such a reminder that Athens is a very diverse place with interactions with people from all around the Mediterranean and beyond, and that the whole region really is shaped by very long histories of migration, exchange, um, trade, of course, conflict. And we can look at um, Sarah Derbu's uh, recent art break with Claire Lyons for links between, for example, the Greek world and the African continent. And it is interesting in this case that someone with an Athenian sounding name mentions a family member with a foreign name. And maybe this speaks to Cleophrates' status as a second generation immigrant to Athens, um, as well as their line of potting expertise. Um, it's important to put this cup also into the context of what was happening politically in Athens, because within two decades after this cup is made, there are new restrictions that really affect non-Athenians lives and livelihoods. So by the 460s, um, there's a new medic tax that immigrants have to pay in order to stay and work in the city. And after 450, 451 BCE, the children of foreign born residents of Athens no longer have a pathway to citizenship. So to return to this cup, then why sign as the Athenian sounding Cleophrates and cite an Egyptian Amasis as a parent? Um, we have evidence from ancient Athens, but also more recent ethnographic work that changing names could be a strategy, right? So to perhaps assimilate into a society 
or evade excessive surveillance, or maybe even just improve your chances of economic survival. I mean, for example, we have roughly contemporary pots signed with intriguing names like Pistozenos, which means trustworthy foreigner, or Onesimos, which means profitable. So we do have to wonder about what kinds of you know, social and I think economic calculations were made when people were signing with these kinds of names. Right, exactly. And, and I think it's, I mean, you know, we just have three words here, but we're already sort of able to open up all sorts of avenues for, for exploration. Let's sort of keep going in that direction and turn to the uh, painter's signature, which appears on the inside of the cup. And so if you were drinking from this, this would only be revealed to you potentially as you were sort of draining your, your cup of wine. Um, you can see, and we've sort of marked with a white box, it runs from the heel of the standing figure up by this it's a sponge and a little oil jar that's hanging in the background uh, up to uh, the standing figure's uh, elbow. Uh, and it reads uh, Doris Egrafsen. And this Doris is someone we know from a good 50 or so uh, inscriptions. And almost as soon as these texts were being documented and, and discovered um, back in the 19th century, um, scholars sort of quickly understood this name Doris and translated it, transliterated it as Doris. And this is how this painter has typically been known. Um, but embedded in this seemingly simple and straightforward act of transliteration, translation, is a substantial assumption that the painter is a man. Now, without getting bogged down in the details of Athenian writing practices and, and the way kind of language is working in the fifth century BC. Um, the letter Omicron at this time, so the second letter in Doris's name, uh, at this particular point when written, uh, could indicate uh, three different things. And so the Greek word that you see here, Doris, uh, could either be Doris or Doris, which are both male names, or Doris, which could be a female name. Now, all the other Athenian, I think I'm right in saying all the other Athenian potter and painter names that survive today uh, appear to be male, uh, but there is lots of evidence from around the world, past and present, um, that would, you know, that indicates very clearly women's involvement in the production of pottery. Right, and we do have three ancient depictions or, or images of women working with pots in ancient Greece and some archeological and of course, a lot of ethnographic evidence from the region that shows that women have always been involved in making ceramics. So I think we need to assume and, and really expect that women workers were in the Athenians potter's quarter. So was Doris slash Doris, uh, I'm just gonna say Doris from now on, um, one of them and maybe even in charge of her own workshop. Right. And to continue in this sort of, uh, you know, the, the, what, the, what the words can tell us and their sort of prompts for kind of exploration and, 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 and digging, digging deeper, um, let's turn to the, the last word, a grafsen, um, which can mean, you know, a number of things, but typically to kind of to write or to draw, it's where we get um, graphic from. Uh, and in this context, as you see, we, we translate it as painted. Right. But, you know, the term can also even though it's generally thought of as a painter's signature, it can also refer to drawing. And you, know, you and I have spent a lot of time in the Agetti's collection looking for these ancient drawings. So just to backtrack at this point in the making process, we have a still sort of slightly damp cup in just the right shape, but with no pictures on it. And in order to guide the painting, these ancient makers sketched out their images first onto the clay with pointed tools, none of which survive, but they leave indented marks on the surface. And they're really hard to see with just your eye, but with a computational photographic technique called reflectance transformation imaging, we can start to pick up these sketched lines um, much more easily. Right, and it's been say, fascinating to work with you as you've been exploring um, you know, our collection and others. Um, this particular cup is on display and actually we've not, or we've not been able to um, undertake this RTI an analysis, but I know um, this cup in your collection in, in Baltimore um, is one that you've studied. And this is also attributed to Doris, the same, the same painter. And we have these two Amazons, these warrior women running uh, left. Uh, and I think I can start a video which actually shows some of this uh, RTI uh, analysis uh, in process. 
Right, so in this um, very short clip, you can see how the software allows you to see these kind of thin, quickly drawn in lines underneath the painted ones. So they appear as these very kind of shadowy lines um, that don't have any color to them. And you can see the full drawn in profile of the figure in the front, and you can see lines guiding the placement of the heads and the arms and um, really all the different parts of these bodies. And you know the drawings are part of someone's process, again, presumably Doris's, of figuring out what this final picture should be. And recent work on the cognitive science of drawing really emphasizes how much drawing is this kind of exploratory act, um, a way to work out what you're thinking about and to test out different possibilities. So by tracking these lines, it's almost as though we can be sitting there looking over Doris's shoulder as they're imagining the world that they're going to paint into life on this pot. And I should say, I really love little moments that feel very intimate and personal. And if you look at a detail of this cup, and here you're looking at the Amazon's helmet, um, you can see these little curls that have been drawn in underneath the helmet. They were not going to be painted in because the helmet covers her hair, but to me, it's just a very human gesture. And I can't help but wonder, right, if Doris was a woman, um, was this little detail a bit of extra care for another woman and a warrior woman at that? I mean, of course we might never know, but it's a reminder that these are real people making these things, right? And their life experiences are parts of these pots, even if we can't identify them. Right, so once, um, and again, like seeing almost like under the surface and, and this, this opportunity to kind of really understand something about the process. Um, once the painter has sketched these figures, it's then time to actually paint them. And if ever you have a chance in your visits to museums around the world, um, and I'm talking to, to the audience here, look closely at these, these, these vessels because you'll see a really wide variety of textures and lines. And maybe on these pictures you can see details of musculature that are rendered with dilute paint or folds of drapery uh, that are marked with little relief lines that stands sort of proud of the surface. Um, and how these painters two and a half thousand years ago have been, were able to achieve uh, these distinctions and the, this definition, um, this has been something that's been puzzling scholars and ceramicists and connoisseurs for, for, for decades. And you know, to think about how these lines were achieved, I mean, someone who's a specialist, presumably like Doris, would have had a preferred set of tools um, at their fingertips in order to create all of these different you know, painted lines. And of course, none of these ancient tools survived, but we do have the lines that they made, which gives us a place to start, right? But to make brushes, you need brush hairs, and in this case, probably animal hairs. And we can look at the archaeological evidence for what animals were around ancient Athens and imagine, you know, whose hair, unfortunately for them, ended up in the painter's toolkit. So I was really delighted to be able to ask Joe Campbell, a wonderful brush maker and a potter, to prototype some brushes for me based on the kinds of brush marks we see on ancient pots. And you see some of the lovely brushes that he made um, for me here. And something broad like, you know, uh, goat hair might have been good for the large black background where you're covering a lot of space quickly. The more chisel shaped goat hair brushes might have been good for the outlines that go around figures. Um, these wonderful squirrel hair brushes could have been used to either make thick or thin lines, depending on how you're pressing the, the brush to the surface and pulling it towards you. Um, and he especially likes um, for these very thin fine lines that we call relief lines, something like ringtail cattail, whose hair is probably quite similar to the hair of ferrets. And we actually see ferrets depicted on Athenian pots. So this is just one way of thinking about what this toolkit might have looked like. Right, and so we go from, you know, potters and painters to ferrets. Um, the one thing we've, the one sort of thing that's left, I guess, in this sort of whistle stop tour of the production process is the actual firing itself. Um, now, the way that, you know, we and our, our colleagues sort of think through this and have explored it is through either um, experimentation or comparison with other contemporary practices. Um, and years and years of scholarship and investigation have led to um, a sort of a convention which you will find in you know, many textbooks and publications that the Athenians uh, fired their pots uh, using a single process, but one that had three stages. Um, but in recent years, both Sanchita and I have been involved in projects that have 
and explored and tested some of these hypotheses and assumptions using either micro or even nanoscale technical analysis or through replication. And I know Sanjita, that's been a lot of your uh, focus of late. Yeah, I have to say testing out the firing process is actually what got me into this research in the first place. And I think that what we certainly as non-potters didn't realize or don't really know as much as we perhaps should is that there's more than one way to fire a pot and pots that look to us like they're made the same way can actually be fired in different sequences. And those sequences, um, when they vary, are actually quite idiosyncratic to how people were trained or like to work. Right. So let's finish up by digging into a little bit of this, this firing process. And thank you all for following us this far. Um, this is the point where the chemistry comes in. And we're going to try, or I'm going to pass on to Sanchita to explain it as clearly as possible. But you know, what I've come to understand is what is crucial here is iron. Um, the iron minerals in the clay um, form differently colored chemical compounds depending upon the temperature, the amount of oxygen, and so on that is available in the kiln. It's really a chemical reaction that takes place during the firing process that produces this very distinctive red and black pottery. So Sanchita, I think we have a graph and I'll hand over <laughs> to you. Don't be afraid people. Um, so let's look at some data from one of our test firings in 2016. And you'll see we've measured firing time in hours along the X axis, the horizontal axis and temperature and centigrade on the Y axis. Um, and saggers here just refers to the four different shelves within our kiln. So it's, it's not that scary. So at this point, we have a clay pot that has been painted with a thinned clay, which we call slip. The clay pot goes into a wood-fired kiln and the temperature inside the kiln is raised from whatever temperature it is outside to about a thousand degrees centigrade, at least in our case, which is that first red arrow that you see here. And this usually takes a period of several hours. In this first phase, which is called oxidation, you have oxygen freely circulating throughout the kiln. And in this very long stage, every part of the pot, which is paint or not um, actually is red. So once we've reached about a thousand degrees, we add damp fuel. In our case, we used olive pits and wet pine boughs um, into the kiln and we sealed off all the ports um, by which oxygen can enter the kiln. Um, this part of the firing is called reduction. So we choke the fire, we make the inside of the kiln very smoky, and this hopefully turns all the surfaces of the pots black. Now from that black arrow, you can see that the temperature drops sharply at this point as we take the oxygen away, but really maintaining this smoky environment for about 30 to 45 minutes is essential for making that glossy black surface that we associate with Athenian pottery. After that, we enter the reoxidation phase where we reintroduce oxygen into the kiln. That's the second red arrow. We remove the um, smoky olive pits or wood, and then we raise the temperature once again, but not as high as it was before. Now, this is the magical stage where parts of the pot that weren't painted, that were not painted, they actually turn back to being red, but the parts that were painted with slip, this thinned clay, actually stay black because a thin layer of glass has actually formed just on those areas and oxygen cannot diffuse through that layer of glass and turn that black back to red. Right, thank you. That was, I think, crystal clear. And that's the, the, um, the account that sort of you can find in you know, many of the major textbooks and scholarly studies. And it certainly helps to explain from a technical um, perspective, you know, the process that, that, that occurs or is believed to occur. Um, I think one of the things I found in the work I've been involved with, and I know with your work too, um, the, this is the sort of this is sort of a, a sort of broad uh, understanding or sort of impression of what happens, but there's scope for different potters to work in different ways, and actually that might be a way that we have to um, understand more about individual working processes. There, there may have been different ways of doing things, and through tracking innovation or variation, one can get into um, certain personal you know, trainings and experiences. Um, but to maybe just sort of step back a bit. Um, you know, I have dabbled with making pots, but I know, Sanchita, you've worked with a kind of ancient Greek style kiln in, in making replicas. And I'm sort of intrigued to know more just about, you know, the practicalities. I don't imagine, say, that, you know, Cleophrides and Duris had a timer and a thermometer to hand as they were working. Well, I mean... 
this is very much for me a, a huge learning experience. And between you know 2015 and 2016, um, Matt Heilick, with whom I taught this course, um, and his colleagues and material scientists, Patricia McGuigan and I, we completed 12 test firings. And we paid attention to what seemed to consistently happen during different parts of the firing. Now, remember, the pots are inside the kiln. You can't see them. And even though we had a lot of sophisticated equipment, we still had to be aware of a lot of other things, um, things that actually ancient potters very much relied on. So the color and quality of the flames shooting out of the kiln, sounds inside the kiln, and distinctive smells of smoke. So we're going to play a short clip from our class film, Mysteries of the Kylix, which means Mysteries of the Cup, um, which shows you that moment of reduction, that brief period when we hope everything is turning black on pots inside the kiln. Right now we're just trying to identify what can it do. Uh, once we get to temperature, we will seal the airports. We'll fill the firebox with kindling, and that starts the heavy reduction cycle. No, we're at 940. Go. We're at 940. Push those boards in a little bit. Yeah. All, right. All right, so let's get ready to seal up the mouse holes. There! All right, step back. Can you see? You all right? We're not as concerned anymore with what the temperature is inside. Uh, we're concerned about what the atmosphere is, and that is smoky and smoldering. This is the part where hopefully things are going black. So you can see it's pretty dramatic, um, even with the sort of stop motion that we just saw there. And it's really consistent in every single firing. So people cough from the smoke and also the smoke smells quite acrid and it makes you cough more. So when I look at black shiny surfaces on pots like the one we've been talking about, I can't help but sort of smell that smoke and hear ancient people coughing. And I would say the most important thing that these firing experiments did for me was to remind me how inventive and responsive these ancient potters were, right? This is very different than how their work has been seen by scholars who have suggested a kind of recipe type production process and have really downplayed their creativity and expertise. So I've come away with these experiments with such a sense of awe for these makers who are working under you know, difficult, unpredictable conditions. And then let's not forget the added economic and social stress that must have come with their varied social statuses. And they still made things that we marvel at 2,500 years later. Yeah, exactly. And I think we wanted to finish just with this slide of um, you know, how these, these parts, including the cup that we've been talking about, are displayed you know, in our gallery here at the villa. And they are presented uh, very cleanly, very elegantly in their sort of vitrines. But I think digging in and understanding just the, the process and production uh, is absolutely crucial um, and also broadens, I think, you know, provides uh, some ways into understanding, understanding the ancient world more broadly. Um, I think in the course of this sort of brief conversation, we've come in some ways closer to Duris and Cleophrides and the others who made this, this cup, but in other ways, um, they and their, their counterparts continue to kind of elude us and, 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 and escape our grasp. Um, I think, Sanjita, maybe do you want the sort of final word before we turn to questions? Sure. I mean, I think the this kind of work for me really emphasizes our need to search for real people's experiences, right, in more flexible and creative ways, uh, and to be more interested in what the reality of the lives of Cleophrides and Doris and, and all of the people of their maker world was like. And finally, I think to really keep working to present the ancient world in its greatest possible diversity. So thank you so much. I've really enjoyed chatting with you and looking forward to the questions. Absolutely. And as I said, please feel free to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box down at the um, uh, down at the, the bottom of the screen. Um, I'm going to start with the, the first question I can see. Um, has a fingerprint ever been detected on ancient pottery? And if so, could any information about the individual be derived from it? Um, Sanchita? Uh, yeah, so Julie Ruby, um, a colleague, uh, has been working on fingerprints and what they might be able to tell us about, for example, the gender or the age of people working on pots. Um, and I haven't seen any recent work, but I know some of the things that 
she was talking about running into in terms of her research is first that you often have just have partial fingerprints or you only have fingerprints associated with certain parts of the process because through the making of these objects, you know, people kind of come and go on these pots as they work. So that's a little bit difficult. The other thing is, um, I, and again, I don't know the science of how fingerprint analysis works, but I think one of the challenges was how we think about ancient populations fingerprints relative to more contemporary ones. But this is something that people are very much thinking about. And I know that, and David, you've probably seen a lot of these, we've seen some in storage together, you often see these kind of, you know, stray fingerprints often around like handles or places where, you know, someone's pressing something at the very end of the making process. Or I think the other way to think about it is when people are throwing pots, you know, they often are using their hands as a way to kind of measure or are used to, you know, sort of um, lifting the pot. So I, I think these, some of these things are present in ways, but they're very elusive in terms of what they can say about a real person. Right, right, right. Um, and in, in the same gallery, in fact, that this cup is, there's, um, we have a, a, a fragmentary vessel that's on display and actually there's um, the pattern down at the bottom, you can actually see one of the there's like a sort of little row of bands and you can see one of them has been smudged by a, by a, by a thumbprint. Um, and in, I mean, in some ways, it's almost remarkable that we see so few because you, I imagine this was really you know, literally hands on work. And it's again, I think, you know, both of us keep coming to this material just amazed at the, the consistent quality of, of, of the painting and the, and the, and the, and the potting. Um, let's have a look for another question. Sanjita, do you see any that you want to? Um, I think maybe there's a question about uh whether it was routine to have signatures. And that's something that I know you've written a little bit about and about marks in general. Um, right, yeah. Um, there, there, are, there, are, there's enough, there are enough signatures for us to be able to talk about them and start to say meaningful, some meaningful things, but by no means was it usual in this cup in particular to have both the potter signature and the painter uh, and particularly seeing the, 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 the one around the foot and then the one on the tondo is, is unusual. It, and you can sort of trace over time, they sort of go in and out of fashion to some extent. We're also dealing with uh, big questions about the extent of literacy and who could write and what they could write. Um, in some cases, it's really interesting, potentially, um, it seems in some cases that uh, a signature might be actually written by a number of different people. There's a potter, Nicosthenes, who seems to have worked with many, many potters and painters. Um, and scholars have determined actually that Nicosthenes of Poyasen might have been written by a number of different people. So it almost sort of operates as a, as a brand. Um, so there's an, an enormous amount of work to do. And it's again, it's really tantalizing because, uh, you know, and, and I think Sanchita, you touched on this when we were talking about Cleophrides and Amasis. You know, what does it mean to kind of write your name, if it is your name, on, on a cup? And do, do the people who are buying these cups in ancient Athens, or maybe if they're being exported as a lot of this Athenian material was, did they even care? Or, you know, who, you know, who's Cleophrides to these people? You know, are these, um, is there some sort of evidence of buyer to make a communication? These are, you know, where we kind of yearn for a kind of time machine. I mean, I think the other thing beyond the kind of rarity at least of signatures on the things we still have from the the ancient record so you know we also have to recognize that this is a tiny sliver of what was actually made so maybe you know a lot more things had signatures on them but at this point this is what we have i think um from just an examination standpoint from looking at some of these signatures you know they have a different kind of visual um and text i guess textural quality to them so it's in my mind very possible that you could have you know had a pot that didn't have a painter's or potter's signature on it and perhaps in a conversation with someone who was interested in purchasing this pot uh the consumer maybe who said you know what i would really love for this to be signed with the name of the maker and perhaps that could have been then added on in a later firing so i I think all this does is it raises more and more questions for us. And the other thing I think to think about in terms of the signature is they're often um, executed in slip that's mixed with um, an iron oxide. So it's not that same slip that's being used for um, all of the other painting, but there's an additional step of adding something else so that it has a different color when it fires. 
So there's an intention to it, but can we identify exactly what that intention was? Uh, I think that's one of the frustrating things that we keep coming back to. Yeah, and I can see there's a, there's a related question. Um, do we think those who signed the pots made them or decorated them or both? And the answer is um, sort of all of the above. Um, a graph sen, um, indicates that this is the, the, the painting and potentially the drawing. We didn't maybe get into the possibility that someone else might have maybe, you know, you know, a lot of these maybe meander patterns might have been prepared by you know, assist other, other people in the workshop, but you know, there's a verb for the kind of act of drawing and the graphic, if you will. And then the apoyosen typically is understood to mean potting uh, and shaping, um, but it's, possible in some cases that that verb could also cover uh, painting as well as uh, as well as potting. So a poison could mean both, you know, the, the potting and the painting. In the case of Doris, we know uh, there are a couple, you know, he typically signs, or, or she or he typically signs as a painter, but there are a couple of instances uh, where they sign as potter, a poison. So Doris was able to make pots. And again, thinking, and I think this is what we have often do, is just sort of thinking of that dialogue and discourse in these workshops and the um, conversation between potter and painter and you know how much was, was the planning of the decoration already kind of part of the of the making process absolutely um, there are several questions on kind of production and uh, I guess maybe I could speak to some of those uh, okay First of all, not a potter. This is why I work with really amazing potters who make it very clear where, you know, I'm sort of presenting things that I've read and not necessarily know how to do. Uh, so if I could kind of basically just say what we're trying to say is things that most potters already know in a sense. Um, but some of the questions that have come up in terms of, you know, the actual making. So we worked with a wood fired um, updraft kiln. Um, this is something that was tried because, well, first, uh, Eleni Hasaki, our, our colleague, has done extensive research looking at these types of kilns. But the kind of research that gets um, mentioned a lot in terms of Athenian ceramics was actually done in an electric kiln. And so part of my interest in actually doing this in a wood fired kiln was because I didn't quite understand how you could get you know, an understanding of the process from a technology that was so far removed from the ancient one. Um, and I think we're still trying to understand how these experiments worked in an electric kiln. Um, so I'm not really sure I can answer, you know, how you would do that now, because I think we're still kind of scratching our heads about what, what one could say. Uh, in terms of the clay that we used, so we worked with this Pittsburgh-based clay, which is an elytic um, iron uh, clay from around um, Pittsburgh that is a commercially available clay and was used actually at the Getty for some of their experimental work. So instead of, you know, going with a different kind of clay and not really having some understanding of how it functioned uh, and introducing a whole lot more var variables to our process, we went with what was already um, fairly well understood by the, the Getty um, scientists. So that's why we chose that. And the slip that we made was actually made also from that same base clay. And again, there's a lot of research into whether ancient Athenian potters were using the same base clay for both their their potting and for their slip. A um, lot of lot of things going on there in terms of the material science evidence. The other thing that has come up here is in terms of the actual production, whether pots uh, were burnished and how we know about um, olive pits and pine boughs. So. Uh, so a lot of this is just kind of tr testing things out, but we do know, for example, that olive pits were used as fuel um, across the ancient Mediterranean. And so it was in a way kind of just to see how that would work. And if you think about Athens and its connection with sort of olive trees and the fact there would have been lots of olive pits available, and it seems like a really um, useful reuse of, of things that would have not been otherwise um, used. Uh, we thought we would try that and we did find that it's a pretty extraordinary fuel, but it also comes with a lot of other complications. We also tried things like dung, don't try dung. <laughs> we learned that the hard way. And, you know, we were 
we were just experimenting to see what would happen. So I think one thing to say is we're not saying we are doing things exactly the way the ancient Athenians did because I mean, on a most basic level, we don't have their clay. Uh, and so we can only get so far with some of these experiments, but it's, it's a way to simply be aware of all of the things that people would have been thinking about and aware of uh, so that they could make, you know, these pots that would be available for sale. So those are one, some one related question to, and to keep coming back to, to your experiences. Um, how many pots would have been destroyed during firing and how effectively could potters manage temperature? Um, so I think contemporary potters that I worked with, you know, they kept counseling me that at least a third of your kiln load would likely not make it. Um, after 12 firings, a lot of our pots were um, perhaps not as spectacular as we hoped, but I think, you know, it reminds you, and certainly from seeing the variability in our kiln loads, even from one shelf to another, that probably these kiln loads were um, pretty varied and the kind of ability to refire something that you didn't fire properly is incredibly important, again, in terms of your resource um, maximization and just you know how people knew how to work with their own clays. I see we're, we're, coming, we're I think we're already at quarter two and there are so many questions and we are thrilled and delighted to, to see them all. I think maybe the last one just to, um, I think I've seen a couple of questions asking for just to, for a final clarification on you know, what the slip is and this whole sort of vitrification. Um, I guess it's worth saying that this, I don't think we actually did, that the slip is a, a more refined version of the, of the clay, as far as we understand, um, obtained through a process of what's called levigation. So essentially, um, evapor you know, you, uh, taking you know, bodies of the, of the, of the clay, uh, mixing it with water, and then allowing um, it it partially to evaporate and then siphoning off the um, the sort of larger particles and then using that the the, the material the the slip that has the the, the smaller particles um, using that essentially as your material to paint with and that then responds in the kiln uh, in this in this way that that we've talked about in terms of um, reacting to the circulation of oxygen and the temperature and this sort of turning glassy this vitrification. Um, at least how I've understood it, it's sort of essentially that the painted areas kind of lock in place so they don't react anymore. I think that's a, a I hope my, my understanding is, is correct. Well, I mean, I would say that what we certainly learned experimentally and that the Getty Athenian Pro Pottery Project has, you know, really shown uh, in terms of its materials analysis is that you need kind of the finest fraction of this, um, this levigated clay. So you're taking, um, this, this clay, you're uh, basically blunging it or you're causing all of the particles to go into suspension. And then you see this separate out into quite distinct fractions. And then you siphon off, as David said, the, the sort of smallest particles and you use that to paint with. And it seems that this ability to form this vitrified surface is really related to the, the smallness or the, uh, the, the tininess of the particles, apologies, material science people. Um, and I think just to give you a sense of it, you know, this is one of the pots where we actually managed to make that kind of glossy surface. And there are other areas where we kind of got a, a very flat surface that doesn't shine as much. And um, I think it's very much related to the ability to use the sort of finest fraction slip that you have. Uh, and then, of course, control the environment in the kiln just perfectly. And how they managed to do this with such consistency, um, stay tuned, still working on that. Exactly. Well, I said we've, we've, we've exceeded our time. And again, thank you so much for all of these um, questions. It's really, um, I think, energizing to see all of your responses and reactions and curiosity. Uh, and again, as Sanjita says, there is still a lot of research to be done. Um, and so, as I say, we, we look forward to being able to share more of this with you in, in a variety of settings and formats um, in the months and, and years ahead. Um, Sanchita, as always, I've enjoyed preparing this and talking about this with you, and I know we will continue these conversations with Duris, with Cleophrides, with many others. Um, and um, I think it remains simply to thank all of you watching out there, wherever you are, uh, for taking, thank you for taking the time. Uh, uh, that is enough for me. Sanchita, do you want to 
Thank you so Thank much. You. And we hope you enjoy looking at more Athenian pots the next time you're around them. Thank you very much. Take care.